So, I want to talk to you all about a, a future, a future of making things, a future of making objects, and a future of making connections between people. First, though, I want to talk a little bit about why. Why making? Um, we, humans, make tools is what we do. Um, this is a, a f every time I give a talk like this, I love to find a tool from this place. It's kind of like someone was talking about the cold of this place, you know, and there's a Quechua word that is like the cold of this place. Well, this is a tool of this place. This is from northern Ecuador, and this is a Latolita people made these uh, fish scrapers um, for removing the, um, removing the scales of the fish. And they made, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them because fingers are terrible for removing scales of fish. So obviously you make a tool, right? But they didn't just make a tool. They made a beautiful, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fish. It's, a, it's, it's like a self-referential kind of, you know, uh, inception kind of thing going on, right? Like some person must have been back in the day sitting there, you know, scraping the fish with their fingernails and then had this vision of, oh, I could have an object that would do this and I could make it look like the fish because this fish is scrapey, you know, it really hurts my fingers to do this. And it must have been a magical moment for them. This process of tool making happens everywhere with all humans. And it's because our, you know, our bodies are limited, let's say, all right? We don't have cool claws or wings or whatever, you know, the good stuff, right? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we, have to, we have to make do with artifice. Um, I love tools. I'm a tool guy. Uh, I, I love hand tools particularly. I think they're extra special, but um, I, I love the idea that you could take some matter and reconfigure it so it gives you special powers, right? Like, it's, it's kind of a magical idea, and we take them for granted, especially like modern tools like cell phones, which are actual magic, right? Like, ridiculously magical. Um, for me, a, a hand drill, that's like, that's still legitimate magic. How else are you going to drill a, you know, one-inch hole in a three-inch thick board, right? Um, it's amazing. It would take forever with your teeth uh, or, or whatever, <laughs> your fingernails, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm a product designer, I'm an engineer, and I founded a design lab to kind of explore this love of tools and this idea of how while tools are cool and lovely, our relationship with the things we make has gotten out of whack somewhere along the line. Uh, and that strangeness, that wrongness, seems to be like this Quechua word for cold that has been lost, similarly related to not being present in the place when we're making the object, not having a relationship to the place making the object, not being somehow humble to our need for objects. So I started a lab called the Humble Factory because I thought at the time it was like a cute play on, oh yeah, you know, factories are terrible. What if we had one that was humble? That would be nice, right? Um, and so initially, I started with this idea that maybe we could make more objects that would empower people locally, okay? Um, when I first got involved with Ted when I first met Veronica. That was because I was doing a lot of work with m modular electronics, okay? So my, my idea was rather than have your one cell phone that costs a bajillion dollars because somebody put it together and shipped it to you and when it's dead in two years, you have to get another one, whole other bajillion dollar cell phone, right? Uh, you could have a cell phone made of little pieces that could be reconfigured. You might have heard of this idea. Somebody took it and ran with it. It's called phone blocks. It's around. Google's doing something with it. Um, this was like a kind of one-off project. And I did some stuff with this modular stuff. And lots of open hardware people are doing things with this modular stuff. This one, the skin skeleton guts idea, 
is a little more interesting, I think, because it involves fabric. So you get to like wrap those modular pieces in something you sew yourself locally out of local materials. Um, but that, that's just the one piece. Okay, that piece led me to thinking about structural materials. So how could you grow materials that would sort of be configured into frames? Um, I haven't gotten to make anything too big with these. It's mostly been little experiments, chairs and tables and things. Um, but I have the idea that we could make these, you know, frame houses and things using this very simple bend and bind. And I didn't invent this. This is just a codification of something people have been doing for thousands of years. Maybe make it a little more aesthetically beautiful because I'm a product designer, you know. Um, and that, that idea, all of these individual tools are still sort of skirting around the big picture. Um, the, the big picture, I will get to in a second, but while we're talking tools, I've also been making tools that help people in different contexts to be hand tool people, right? So remember, part of this humbleness is about getting back to your roots. It's about getting back to this place and these people. And one way to do that is to think about how do you do transport? in a city, okay? I'm not gonna have horses to move stuff around. I, I could use a car, sure, but that relies on an infrastructure. They don't build cars in Seattle. We don't have a car factory in Seattle. And even if you did have a car factory in Seattle, it would be Tesla, which requires that China make its batteries, which requires that Bolivia, you know, sell all of its lithium to China to make the batteries to go to see. It's ridiculous. Okay, so I would rather make some transport that is my transport, Seattle's transport. And I have to transport things maybe two, three miles, and it's stuff for the garden. Okay, so it's like a bunch of pine needles to mulch my blueberries, or it's a pallet to make a retaining wall with, or it's a bunch of wood from the store. And I got this idea actually from Chinese wheelbarrows. They, in the, in the, um, the I don't know, maybe like the, the 1100s, uh, there were these emperors in China that made these armies, huge armies, where all of the stuff was transported by a wheelbarrow. And they would even put sails on the wheelbarrow and the wind would sort of help push the wheelbarrow forward, right? And it was possible because everything was mounted over this center of mass of this single wheel. And you can see there's just one wheel there. So you have to get one nice bike wheel. It doesn't have to be that nice, right? Um, but then you have that, that, that one wheel that you can balance stuff on. It works really well. And you can run with this. I've, I've run two, three miles with hay bales piled on this thing. And let me tell you what, nobody thinks you are a threat when you are jogging with a wheelbarrow full of hay bales. Like, you know, mothers pushing their strollers come up to you, oh, hey, what are you doing? You know, like, in any other context, why would they do that? But there's something, there's something disarming about it. Really, there's something disarming about a man with a wheelbarrow. Um, jogging down the street. Following on that theme, I thought I'd really get people excited, and I did basically the same thing, but with a sewing machine um, on a bike. And so I, I built this bike on a sewing machine or a sewing machine on a bike and rode around to farmer's markets and fixed people's pants and uh, sewed them bags to take their groceries home in. Um, and this, more than anything, led me to this realization that it's not so much the tools. It is something to do with this humility. It's something to do with what am I doing differently when I'm walking down the street with the hay bales that people, all different races of people and socioeconomic classes of people come up to me and nobody carries hay bales on the streets of Seattle. I don't know, y'all may come from cultural norms where people do carry hay bales, and that's awesome. I'm envious, okay? But it doesn't happen in Seattle. So there's no, there's no reason that people should feel comfortable with this. 
Instead, <laughs> these people are like, oh yeah, the, the hay bale guy, awesome. Or the, the, guy with the, the guy with the bike, with the sewing machine, of course him. There's something communal that happens. And I've lost this thing, so I'm gonna have to check back. I think the more important thing to keep in mind is there is a community, there is a humility in design that can bring a community together. It's about connecting people, okay? Not about connecting these, uh, these abstract tools and just kind of throwing it out there. So now, most of my work is looking at how to make more connections happen, okay? And that comes from, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that comes from this place of humility, okay? What does humility mean in the case of products, in the case of making? Well, first, it has to mean something about scale, okay? You have to have a small scale where you can know people, where you can be involved with people. I'm trying to get this idea of a scale, um, I call it the picnic number, okay? That's the order of one picnic. If you can have a picnic with the amount of people you're talking about, that's a picnic number. Okay, so like it's somewhere between five and a hundred people. I don't know, maybe y'all have big picnics, but I, I feel like a hundred people would be pushing it, right? So when you make something happen, you want it to be on the order of a hundred people. So now we can ask ourselves interesting questions. How do we make surgery happen with a hundred people in a hospital? How do we make I don't know, how do we save all the plant diversity of the world using groups of 100 people rather than, you know, using that one amazing, beautiful place? How do we make, uh, how do we make the internet happen? How do we make robots? How do, we make, how do we make the cool things we love but without having to rely on, you know, Facebook or Google or someone that's capitalized at billions of dollars? Okay, those guys are great. They can do their thing. And we'll try to figure out another way so when they go off and do something else, we're still supported, okay? So scale is important. Second thing that's important is you need to have connection. You need to have a group. This is a group called the Open Source Ecology. This is Marcin Jacobowski is another TED fellow. Um, and he is in, uh, oh, where are they, Missouri. And they are building a, a toolkit to rebuild civilization. Um, it's a little ambitious, maybe, uh, but the cool thing about it is they are actually building it. They, they have gathered together a huge group of people, both locally and scattered around the world, replicating their work, and they are making this thing happen. They are building tools for making mud bricks, compressed mud bricks. They're building tools for, for agriculture. They're building computer-controlled tools for cutting out pieces of wood, all kinds of interesting stuff. And all of it, they are really focused on the third point, which is it has to be open. It has to be open and shared and inviting other people to participate. And the reason for that, the most important reason for that is you need to get the other person's perspective Perspective is more valuable in this scheme. Knowledge on the ground, understanding of the context is more valuable than the actual technology, okay? And that's why, again, like Quito, how many other cities in the world are, number one, at this altitude, okay? Number two, long and skinny and weird in a mountain range, right? And number three are embedded in the the South American context, which is an amazing history of all kinds of complicated things, starting with fish graders, right, and moving through everything else. And every city is like that. Seattle is like that. San Francisco is like that. Boston is like that. You know, Mumbai. <laughs> like, I could name all the cities in the world. Every city has something to offer. So this openness is necessary to make that happen. How do we go forward? So, I've been working on two projects uh, to try to seed these sort of systemic interactions, okay? The first one is a literal seeding project. Um, it's based on a Mesoamerican technology called the Three Sisters. 
Um, it was actually transformed into the Four Sisters in uh, the southwestern U.S., but that's like you grow corn or maize, you grow beans, and then you grow melons or um, squash, something, on the bottom. And they all three of them support each other, okay? Uh, in permaculture, uh, we call this a guild, a group of plants working together, okay? This is a guild that I've been building out. This is not for food, okay? This is poke on the... Um, Poke on the right, left. Uh, poke is a dye, makes purple. You can make purple out of poke. Um, then there's swamp milkweed, uh, which makes a fiber. And then I'm growing willow as a coppice, which makes a, a pole. And those three things added together, I can do the bend bind framework. So I can make purple thread and bind together sticks and make like, you know, tents or something. I don't know, some cool kind of structure bicycles, chairs, and all three of these plants grow together really well in Seattle. And I could send you a, a box that had all of these seeds in it, and you could start a factory for growing, you know, chairs with this box if you wanted. And I think I can do this with other things. I think I can do this with, like, headphones. I think I might be able to do this with, um, weird consumer electronics, using plants, okay? Uh, have some experiments that are going on doing this, this kind of stuff. You see, though, that this idea of growing all these things together and then mixing them and remixing them needs a little more support. There are not good words to describe this kind of idea currently, okay? We say guild or it's like this other thing. So the other project I've been working on is one called Alchematter, which is trying to take a process like that, you cut down a tree and you shave it into a whatever and something, and modularize that process. So we start with the tree and we start with some paint and we go through different transforming steps till we end up with a final product, a bench. These modular procedures can be remixed. I can grab a piece of one or a piece of another and move it toward something, move it toward something else, add it to another procedure. I can make really complex procedures. In this case, I think it's for, oh, this one's not super complex. I thought I had one up there that was for a whiskey and soda, um, where you actually you make the whiskey and you make the, the, grow the orange and you make the bitters and you do all this stuff. And you could imagine remixing all of those things for really localized ideas. So instead of sharing like the right way to do something, the way that our globalization tends to do, we would share a useful pattern that you should remix and share hundreds of those patterns. Then, if we can get there, we have the opportunity to have these kinds of individual interactions. Me, some random people talking about how am I gonna fix their pants. This literally is fixing pants. Um, I want to have that same kind of connection with my people in my community, and I want to enable all of you to have that same kind of connection if you are, you know, people that feel like you want to be product designers. I humbly posit to you that this is something about the future, that the future is somehow humble. Thank you so much.